Thanks, Again, my name is Heather Larkin. I'm an associate professor here in the School of Social Welfare at the University at Albany. Really honored to be with you today and so happy to be able to introduce our speakers and later on our panelists. So we're really fortunate now to have Mary Sice with us this afternoon. Mary Sice is a licensed clinical social worker with a private practice in Latham, New York. In addition to being traditionally trained, she's actually um, graduated from our program here over 20 years ago. Mary integrates energy psychology methods into her practice and has trained hundreds of clinicians in these methods. She's a pioneer in the field of energy psychology presenting at conferences, developing trainings and coursework, especially in the area of releasing negative beliefs and healing trauma and dissociation. She is often an invited presenter at top trauma conferences, including the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine and the internationally recognized prestigious Boston Psychological Trauma Conference with Best Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Mary is the past president of the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology, the professional organization for training, research, and humanitarian work. The University at Albany is also collaborating with Mary on a research project studying an energy psychology method known as EFT, or the Emotional Freedom Technique, with people who have survived a significant heart event. There's information about that study out front on the tables. Please grab it on the way out. You can get both a press release and a flyer to share with others and at your agency. Um, and so please be sure to get that information. We're in the recruitment phase and could definitely use your help letting people know about it if it's something that's of interest to them and could be potentially helpful to them. In 2007, Mary co-authored the book, The Energy of Belief, Psychology's Power Tools to Focus Intention and Release Blocking Beliefs. Mary is also the program director for Her Holiness Sai Ma's Transformational Healers Program and teaches internationally on the spiritual dimension of health and healing. So I'm really happy and honored to introduce Mary Sice, who will be our first presenter this afternoon. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you, Heather. I'm really honored to be here, and I'm absolutely thrilled at the number of you who have taken the time to come to this kind of a conference today. It's awesome that we here in Albany, New York, can be talking about trauma in such a way that we can bring forward this brain research. This Whoa, this new information. That kind of shakes everybody up. <laughs> Is that working? Is that working okay? So it kind of shakes everybody up because it's so outside the paradigm of what we know as clinicians, of what we've been trained as clinicians. It really shakes the foundations of many of the things that we do. But yet, if you've been in the field for a long enough time, you know that oftentimes what we were doing wasn't working. I know that was the case for myself. I, like many of you, was, um, you know, what's with this thing? Uh, I have done my time in the trenches. I worked at St. Anne's in the 70s when the nuns were still there, so that's kind of a long time ago. I kid Mary Beth, I hired her back in the 70s. That's how old I am. I was at Parsons for a while. And then I went back to the school, this school here, the School of Social Welfare. That's how I know trauma. I still have a few papers I don't think I turned in yet, so I'm having some flashbacks. Hope they don't catch me. And research, oh my God. That was like my worst one. But anyway, so I came here. And then I spent, from after I got my master's, I went and worked over at the old CHP. How many of you remember that? The CHP was a big HMO, and we eventually became Kaiser Permanente. The wonderful thing about working there in an HMO was that we did have a very collaborative uh, staff there. We all worked together with the physicians, and it was in the... I worked with many, many psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers, and we all worked together. It was easy to work like that. The good thing about working there is that um, 
we had a lot of clients because anybody who had our insurance in the old days kind of had to come to us. We, and it was like two bucks to see us. So, you know, it's like rent a friend sometimes <laughs> for two bucks. And plus, it, by the way, you could go for, at one point you could go for two bucks and see all your doctors just for two bucks in one day, you know, so. Anyway, we had a lot of clients. And the joke goes is that um, one day in a staff meeting, I said that I really liked working with borderlines. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but from that point forward, any client that came in who had been in the hospital or they were suicidal or cutting or dramatic or whatever, they, they would just say, oh, Mary Sice likes working with those. So <laughs> before long, I had the caseload from hell. The good news of that for me, though, was because if you had our insurances, you had to come to us. So none of my colleagues wanted me to leave. Not because they liked me, but because they really just didn't want my cases. So they would allow me to go train in whatever thing I could dig up to train in. And because I had a huge trauma caseload, and I realized really early on that even though I had I had done the trainings that we're supposed to do for trauma. Trauma, frankly, is a very relatively new field. It really has only been um, in the, you know, in the 90s that they started looking at trauma and, and looking at the guys that were coming back from Vietnam and seeing that they had many of the same symptoms as many of the women sexual abuse survivors. Or, or, and then how do we even treat them? We, we didn't know what to do. And so I would, I would go to the trauma conferences and do everything, you know, there's a stage model and all that, but I, I found that oftentimes they would just get worse. They would just kind of deteriorate in front of my office, and I didn't know why. The brain research isn't out. None of this stuff was out. So the good news for me was they let me go train. They wouldn't necessarily pay for everything I could dig up to train in, but they would let me go train in whatever I wanted. And so in the early 90s was when I heard of one of the brain processing techniques I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later called EMDR, which is an eye movement therapy. How many of you might be trained in that here or know about it? All right. Good, good, good. So it was an eye movement therapy, you know? And so after I trained in that and I came back and I'm waving up my hands in front of their eyes back and forth and my people are like getting better. Um, the nightmares were stopping, the flashbacks were stopping. They were, and more importantly, when you're working in an HMO, you're not putting them in the hospital. That was like really what they didn't want you to do. And so, because um, it was all about cost and whatever. And they were getting better, they were getting off their medication. And then I, I still had a segment of my caseload that was so traumatized that I couldn't do EMDR because it wasn't safe. They had to go home and it just, it just wasn't safe for them. So I kept searching, you know, what else can I do? And I, I would train in anything, I, and then whatever. So at one point I was in an EMDR training actually and they started talking about energy psychology, you know, where you like tap on these meridians. I didn't even know what a meridian was. I don't own Birkenstocks or have any flowy skirts, so I don't know why I was in this energy thing. <laughs> but I was desperate. I was desperate. So whatever. You could learn for a donation, I think, at the time. I don't know. I got some videos. I sat there and watched them and thought, I can do this. This is pretty cool. And um, I went out. I went to work the next day, and my I made my colleagues come in my office and I said, I got this new thing, you know, and remember, they don't want me to leave because they don't want my cases, so they would play along with me. And um, so I'm doing this tapping stuff and moving their eyes around and nailing the anxiety and, and all sorts of things. Like pe people were like chilling out right in front of my eyes. And at one point, the head of psychiatry comes in and was, CHP was at the time we were merging with something and there was all this stress going around. So he had this TMJ pain. I said, well, come here. I got this new thing. And he, they just kind of rolled their eyes at me. You know, they don't, they were putting up with me. But anyway. So I had him focus on his pain and we're tapping and moving eyes and it was gone. And he was like, what are you doing? And I go, I don't know, I only watched three videos. I got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but isn't this really cool? So, but what really got me into the energy psychology field was when I had a patient uh, in my office who never could use a bathroom in public because that's where she was molested as a teenager. And so she'd be at work or in the mall or something and she would, she would, have to come home to use her bathroom. And so I said to her, well, I just went to this training. I got this new thing. You know, by now my clients are also used to me going to these trainings. 
And um, so whatever, we did it. We, we I had her imagine going in the bathroom. We tapped and moved her eyes around, and boom, it was gone. I said, well, let's test it. There was no anxiety. The panic wasn't in her stomach. So I said, go to our bathroom, see, see what happens. So she went to the bathroom. She went in. She used the bathroom, and no, it, the anxiety maybe on a 0 to 10 scale was about a 2. And she was like, she came out of there. She goes, I just used the bathroom. Like, you know, the people thought she was nuts that she said it to, but... She was thrilled. It was gone. She came back to the office. We did one more round of it. She was able to go to her work, and from that point on, she never had a problem going to the bathroom in public. It was gone. So once that happened, I thought, all right, this is so weird, and I'm really supposed to be kind of straight, but I got to go learn this stuff. And that's how I got into this field. So now I've been in the field, because I was one of the newer people in the field, now I'm really old in the field, so... I was there early because my trauma caseload was so big. I had multiply traumatized dissociative identity disorder clients. All I figured out ways that you can use these newer treatment methods to heal fragmentation, dissociation, and trauma. So I'm, what my role here with you today, what I'd love to get across to you, is that treatment is possible. People can heal from trauma. They can heal from what happened to them. Okay. Now we have the brain science that proves what clinically we, we, we're seeing in our office over and over and over again with some of these newer methods. So that's what I hope to impart to you today. My plan is to talk about what's a normal, I don't know if there's a normal brain, but whatever. What's a normal brain? I want you to think about that also, not just in terms of your clients, but in terms of yourself. Because if you get this for yourself, you'll do it with your clients. If you see this works for yourself, you'll do it with your clients. So today, for the first part especially, we're going to talk about for yourself. Then I'm going to talk about how trauma is a game changer for everybody, what happens in trauma in the brain. And then the third part of it will be how to treat it. I'm going to show you a simple energy psychology method that we'll use here with us. So you have something, a tool you can take back, use it on yourself first, and then use it with your clients. And then I'm going to show you a little video, about 10 minutes, of a person who was robbed at gunpoint, where we use some of this. So that's how I hope the day will go, and that um, our time together will go, and I'm really glad, grateful you're here. So let's talk about what do we really know anyway about that brain. Okay, here's the bad news. Your brain focuses on what's wrong, and we're hardwired that way. Okay? It, uh, it scans the place. It looks for bad news. Has anybody noticed that about their brain? Like, it just like looks for bad news. We talk about bad news, we look, we watch the news. We watch the news, how many people watch Channel 9, you like watch the same news over and over and over again? <laughs> That's the brain, it just looks. We're not set up to be or to act rational. So, unless, oh, I forgot to ask, is anybody here an alien? Okay. <laughs> then this is how it goes. This is how we are set up in these human forms. It's not who we are. Our essence is perfect. Our essence is divinity. But we're hanging out in these bodies with a brain that's wired for survival. Okay? Negative interactions will have more impact on the relationship than positive ones. How many of you have gotten an evaluation and it had 85 glowing things and you remember the one thing you got wrong? <laughs> Right? And I don't care how you try to frame it to your spouse when you're trying to give him like a, a corrective action he ought to take. It never works, right? You could say all the right things first, and what do they focus on? Or your kids. The one thing you said that they didn't want to hear. So we're like Velcro for negative. Can you get that concept? And we're like Teflon for anything positive. We just don't even take it in. It's like our brain, it doesn't even compute, right? Okay. Um, impulse and inclination will precede conscious thought, and we're hardwired that way. So that's the bad news. In these bodies of ours, we're hardwired that way. The good news is the brain is not fixed. It has plasticity, and if you want to read some really good stuff, Norman Deutsch's um, book, The Brain That Changes Itself, is excellent. This is all the new things. They used to think your brain was 
it was it was fixed and we couldn't change it. We know that's not true at all. Oh, by the way, I, all these handouts are in your packet. I gave you a copy of them, so you don't have to take any notes. Just kind of be with it and and think about your, especially think about yourself. Okay. So you can use your mind to change your brain. That's the good news, the really good news. You can retrain it. Your brain loves routines and habits, it t and it'll take you 30 days to change a habit. How many of you have noticed that? Like you get a habit of like exercise, right? <laughs> How long does that last? <laughs> you know? Or a diet, how many of you can stay on a diet? Like, forget about it, right? It, we like what we like. We, we have our habits, we have our ways of being. So if you're gonna, that's why if you're gonna retrain your brain, you have to be consistent with it. You have to do the same thing over and over again. How many of you have like moved to a new apartment or a new house and you leave work and you still go to the old house? <laughs> okay, you get it? That's just how we are. And our brain is, it's, it's for survival. Okay, I got that, 30 days, I got that, I got that. Now, it, now it's in there. And it drops into a different area of our brain. So we don't even have to think about it anymore. So our brain likes habits. Once a habit is established, it takes, again, it takes about 30 days. Um, it, it's gonna take you another 30 days. And you know, some of you older people like me, it's gonna take a lot longer than 30 days to change a few of your habits, I hate to tell you. Kids, we might have a little better luck with, but figure 30 days. The basic organizer of your brain is habit. We're creatures of habit. You have to repeatedly retrain it. So not once in a while, not once a week, and think you're gonna get a new habit. You have to do it every day, preferably several times a day, your new habit, to begin to retrain your brain. Okay, and there's all sorts of research on this. There's all sorts of research about people where they had them imagine playing the piano, and then they had other people actually practicing the piano. The imagined ones did just as well as the real practicers, but again, it was about repeated doing it over and over and over again. And the other thing about the brain and all this talk about brain and new brain science and brain, 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 the bottom line is it's really not that simple. Don't think this science isn't gonna change either because it will. It's very new research, okay? It's really only been um, in the last 20 years maybe that this research has been coming out where they've been able to see inside the brain and see what happens in the brain. So it's, we're at the very, very beginning stages of what we're going to find out about the brain. So it's changing rapidly. So it's not simple. And the bottom line is most of us, including our clients, just glaze over with these details. I know it took me about three months to figure out how to say amygdala. So what I'm gonna to try to do for you today is simplify some of this so that you can teach it to your clients. Okay? So that you don't so that you have something you could work with. So the bottom line is here's your brain. The middle part of the brain, where all where the color is, that's your fight, your emotional brain. Fight, flight, freeze is all in there, and also um, reproduces in there. The other F word, um, <clears throat> which I can't say because we're taping. So that's what that part of the brain does and worries about and thinks about. Okay. So the most important point, and, and basically what happens, I want you to notice the eyes. Notice that the eyes are on the outside of the brain, which may account for some of the newer um, brain things that we're doing that are using the eyes in order to process trauma. When I talk about trauma a little bit later, we'll talk about that. But the eyes get the brain, if you move the eyes around, you're gonna get your brain to light up in a different way which has, is helpful in processing trauma. Um, I'll explain that later. The biggest part that we need to know about the, the, the brain is that amygdala. Okay, and the easiest way to think about it is your amygdala is like your smoke alarm, okay? You know how you have a smoke alarm in your house and you turn your oven on and your smoke alarm goes off? It's the exact same thing in your brain, okay? It's like a smoke alarm. It goes off first and asks questions later. Okay, just like in your house, your smoke alarm might go off because you didn't clean your oven. It's not necessarily a three alarm fire in your house, but off goes your smoke alarm and you have to figure out, is there a fire or did I just not clean the oven? The amygdala's job 
is to send a signal to the rest of the brain telling you whether or not you need to pay attention. So, an example would be if someone comes up to you and puts a gun to your head and the person has red hair, okay, your amygdala is going to go, oh shit, oh, we're on tape. Anyway, it's going to say something like that. And it doesn't even say that. It just sends this alarm, and it's going to fight, flight, or freeze. You will not be thinking about reproducing at that point. <laughs> okay? So fight, fight, or fleet, freeze. It's going to send the alarm. Once the amygdala sends the alarm, what happens is, the, and I'll show you it here. Okay, here's the, so here's the top part of your brain where your smarts are. And underneath is your limbic region, okay? The minute that amygdala sets its alarm, what happens is the louder it is, the less of your neocortex you've got online, okay? So some guy comes up and he puts a gun to your head. Your amygdala is firing. Off goes your, you don't need your neocortex. You don't need to discern, hmm, I wonder if he dyes his hair. I wonder, you know, how, you know, how many steps it's going to take me to run. You just run or you freeze or you, don't, or you fight. But the guy with the gun, you're probably not going to fight. You're probably going to actually go right to freeze because you don't want it to hurt when the gun goes off. So once it's set, from that point forward, any time, and, and by the way, you didn't die, any time you see someone with red hair, a male with red hair, that smoke alarm's going off. You're going to have anxiety, and you're going to go into fight, flight, or freeze, depending on how it was set at first. So now think about that. I'll give you a good example of my own. When my children were growing up, I used to teach parenting classes. I figured, hey, never run a group you don't need. <laughs> so at that time, everybody was into those I statements. I, blah, 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 I, blah, blah, blah. And so that was what I was teaching, OK? I knew more I statements that you ought to say to your kids than you know, I could give you an I statement for anything. And then I would go home. So I'd walk in the house, and most of the time, frankly, I think I was pretty good. My kids might have another point of view, but I think I was pretty good. But the thing that would always get me is if the house was a mess. Like, I would like be, there was no I statement to be found. I would like scream at them, what, how many times not the maid, you're grounded from the prom. Like, you know, like. <laughs> or your birthday party or something stupid. Like, you, you get stupid when you're limbic. Does that make sense? OK? Like, you, you go to say something, and you're just stupid. You know, it's like, and the kids would look at me. And my kids would say, you know, you could murder somebody, and mom could handle that. But God, what is it with that woman, OK? Well, I found out later, after much therapy, no, after brain science, the problem for me was that my amygdala, when, the, when I was a little girl, and my dad was in the war, many of you might have parents that were in the war, so when he, what, and by the way, I have 11 brothers and sisters, he wasn't good with chaos, I don't know what he was thinking, he wasn't limbic, I'm telling you, I mean, he wasn't rational. <clears throat> anyway. So in my house, when the house was a mess and chaotic and my father came home, that's when heads would roll. He went limbic, okay? And it would be dangerous. So my brain had it coded, messy house equals danger. Now that wasn't the situation in my house at home. My husband could care less if the house were a mess and the kids could care less too. I was the only one acting like, you know, get ready for a fight, get ready for danger, watch out, watch out. And I would go so limbic. And that was like the on, only, well, not the only thing, but the major thing that would put me into a limbic stupid response with no I statement to, that could be found. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys know this. Like how many times are you sitting in your office saying, pontificating on some blah, blah, and part of you is going, oh, you should have been in our house last night. That wasn't happening. <laughs> right? Okay, I mean, that's not just happening in my house, right? It's happening at your house? Okay, good. Why? You're limbic. You got triggered. Okay. So the more limbic we are, the less rational we are. This top part of your brain, the neocortex, is the part of your brain that's rational. Once something gets triggered, 
Off goes your brain and your limbic system is running the show. This has great survival value because if somebody's going to hurt you, you're going to try to fight back. And you'll see this with some of your kids. They're really, they fight. They go right to, right? Right? I mean, you just have to like touch them and off they go. Or they, uh, or they run, they, they avoid, they get anxious, they start moving, the body starts moving. It doesn't even make sense for today. Or they freeze. And freeze means they dissociate, they check out. Okay, and it's a habit. It's a habit that the brain does, the amygdala fires, and off they go. Something got triggered in them. So it's really important to teach this to people so they understand why, for a couple of reasons. One, they're not crazy. Okay, you're just limbic. You just went limbic. Okay, and two, that we can reset it. And to me, um, it's my way of thinking of how to be a therapist now. My job is to help you reset it. My job is to help you figure out what just set you off, and then let's reset it using some of the, some of the newer tools we have now that can reset that amygdala. Just like my woman that now can go into a bathroom and she doesn't fear that somebody's going to come out at her and abuse her. She knows this is the bathroom at Walmart, and I'm safe. Make sense? Okay. All right, so I told you that. Okay, this is the other thing to get across. I just pushed your buttons. I did not install them, okay? And to teach that to, to people, that any time you've got two limbic brains fighting, it's not pretty. It's just bad, you know? Some people, like if you go into freeze, oh, we were talking about this the other day. So some, usually men go into fight, okay? So they're off goes their neocortex, they're really saying stupid stuff. Okay, which of course they think is logical and justified, right? The women, their neocortex goes, she, now she's mad, but she goes there, but she freezes. And then, then they might go their separate ways for a while. She goes over here, her brain comes back online, and she's like, oh, why didn't I say this and this and this and this and this, right? Women, how many of you got that going, right? Like you can't find a good comeback for nothing, right? That's because you're in free, you go into freeze. And then your brain comes back online, you want to come back. His comes back online, he comes back, I didn't mean it, honey, baloney. Your neocortex didn't mean it, but your limbic system meant every word of it. So, <laughs> so the real issue here is to get it, that we get triggered. We're hardwired this way and we're not crazy. And it has nothing to do with the current character. Okay, it more has to do with how this got set in the first place. The other important thing that we all have to be aware of about our brains <clears throat> is that um, is the, this, whole, um, this whole thing about beliefs and why we believe what we believe about ourselves, okay? And the best way for me to think about this is ju th just think about yourself and think about the people that you serve. If you go to the nursery and you see those babies, they're absolutely perfect. They're beautiful. They're free, they're open, they're loving, they're open for anything. In fact, they're like, energetically, they're like sponges. They take in everything in the environment because they have no filter. So they absorb all the energy. That's why people like to be around babies. And then what happens is somebody takes them home. <laughs> and there's where the fun begins, okay? So children, when they first go home, when your baby first comes home, their brain wave is primarily in a delta state. It goes very slow. That's why babies sleep all the time, because they're in delta, okay? But they're absorbing everything. They're absorbing, uh, is there stress in the house? Is there enough money? Is there enough food? Another hungry mouth to feed? Uh, you know, did you ever hear the story of the Dalai Lama? This is a funny story. They said um, the Dalai Lama was at a con this is a true story, was at a conference, I think it was at Harvard or someplace. And so they're talking about self esteem. And the Dalai Lama's like, self esteem? What's self esteem? Whoa, Dalai Lama, it's self esteem. They try to explain self esteem. He still didn't get it. And he says to his translator, what's the word? I can't get the word. What are they talking about? And the, self and the translator is trying to explain to him self esteem. Well, I guess in his country, they don't have self-esteem problems. Like, we have books on it, like, you know, volumes, and people get their degrees in it and everything else. Well, I want, you know, think about it. I don't know about your family, but were they saying namaste at your house when you were born? Like, I honor the divinity within you. Nobody was saying that at my house. I, I don't know, maybe you guys had it at your house. So the question is, what were they saying in your house? 
because that's what's programmed into you. So mostly the baby sleep sponges, everything goes in. And then under the age of seven, mostly under seven, they're in a theta state, which is more of like a, of a drowsy, it's a very programmable state. So for example, as a hypnotherapist, if I talk really, really slow, and you start to entrain with my thoughts, and I take you really deep, and you go deeper, that's a theta state. I would, if I'm not going to do that, because you all fall asleep on me, and I made too many slides for that to happen. But, <laughs> but this theta state is very programmable. For example, in, in hypnosis, we can put you in a theta state, and then we can do surgery on you, tell, them, tell you not to bleed. And your brain will do all that. Your body will do all that, will respond to it. They, it's like and they can do, put you on, they can put a, a dime on you, tell you it's a hot coal, and you'll actually blister. That's a theta state. Our children are in that state most of the time. That's why if your sister called you a fat lard, you still think you're fat <laughs> under the age of seven. Anything that got told to you, anything that happened, goes in like a program. The other time you're in a theta state is when you're in trauma. Time expands, things go slow. It's like, it, there's like, it's a state. You're in a different state. So anything the perpetrator of the trauma said, or your father said when he was hitting you, or your mother said, or anything of that will go in as, as a program with the same power as something that was hypnotically put in you. That's the status state. Then when you get older, over seven, Eight, nine, ten, whatever, teenage years, you're more in alpha, beta. Like right now, you guys are going, if I make you laugh, I can get you up to beta, that gets you a little waked up, woken up. And then you'll go into alpha, like when you're watching a movie sometimes, and all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of in the movie. Now you're between alpha and theta. Okay, so you're more, it's more... Um, Relax would be an alpha beta. You're very, you're more alert. And if you have teenagers, they're mostly in those two states, which is why you cannot program them. So give it up. <laughs> if you haven't programmed them by seven, you're screwed. <laughs> okay. So those, that's really important to know. So in general, what's important to know about our implications for us, for our practices? We have to educate our clients. It's never about today. And make fun of yourself. Like, let's take the drama out of the trauma, OK? It's like not about today. Unless you're an alien, this is how we're hardwired. It's just part of the game of being a human. It's part of the human condition. There's nothing pathological about it. Um, so instead, it's never about today, like, like you would say to them, what does this remind you of? Where have you felt this way before? And then that's where we do our work with our clients. It's not in today. It's just, this is just triggering something else. But first you have to explain that, and then that's where the action is. That's where the work needs to be done when we're working with people. Or when we're working with ourselves. Wow, what's going on with me? Where did I feel this way before? You know, instead of trying to get the whole world to try to behave so you don't get triggered, forget about it. There's nothing wrong with them. It's what happened to them. That, that to me, if you can get that out of this program, it's never what's wrong with people. Think of that baby in the nursery. It's what happened to them. Who took you home? What did they tell you? Did dad lose his job? What was going on? Was mom sick? Did mom have a postpartum dis depression? What happened to you? There's nothing wrong with you. And there's nothing wrong with their parents. What happened to them? And what happened to their parents' parents? And it goes on and on and on. It doesn't imply, though, that they're not responsible for their behavior. You can't help that you get triggered. In fact, in some spiritual traditions, they think you should thank the person who triggered you because it gives you an opportunity to work on something. I wouldn't necessarily go that far today, but it really is the right idea. Okay, but we're responsible for how we handle our triggers. We're responsible for what gets triggered, in, for that we have this in us. It's been tri it's been triggered, and I'm responsible for what I do with my anger. Not that I, I'm not responsible that I got I, that I got angry. The anger's in my field. It's there, but I'm responsible. I take responsibility now for what I do with my energy. Um, what they were observed or what you were told under the age of seven is what you will believe about yourself. 
Okay, that's just how it goes. And the other thing is we can use some of these newer methods to shift beliefs. That's why we, I was passionate about writing about beliefs, because I know you could change them once we took the energy out of them, the anger, the shame, the unworthiness, whatever you've got programmed. If you can get the energy out of it, the belief shifts. Why? Because it's not who you are. You're that baby in the nursery. You're that divine creation. You're not this. This is just what happened. Okay, for children, if you're working with children, that dad's reaction was because dad was triggered. This is what happens. Okay, it has nothing to do with you. And if you're working with someone with domestic violence, your partner's reaction or behavior was because the partner was triggered versus you, I shouldn't have said this. I sh if I only did this, then he wouldn't have done that. Okay, it's not about that. Everybody's responsible for their behavior and it has nothing to do with what you did. You pushed the button, you didn't install it, and everyone's responsible to clean out what got installed. If we're gonna change the brain, we need to do focused, sustained attention. We can do guided imagery, role playing, not talk and logic. It, you can't get there from there. It's a different part of the brain. We have to put them, we can use, we can use imagery a lot more than we are currently using it now to get people to begin to imagine their future or imagine what they can create for themselves or what would they like to create for themselves and to see really how powerful they are to create for themselves. One of the hallmarks as we, that David spoke about this morning of people with trauma is they have this foreshortened future. They, they don't dream. They don't even think they're going to live that long. Okay, so to help them begin to create now, to imagine the future that you'd like, and then I'm going to teach you some strategies that we'll do energetically that will strengthen that. Distress tolerance, not problem solving. Distress tolerance, teaching them how when you get triggered, this is how you take it down. This is how you reset your brain a little bit. This is how you calm your nervous system down. And we'll talk about some strategies for that. Rewire them so that they're not held hostage by automatic reactions. Does that make sense? Great. Okay, so now trauma. Trauma's a game changer, okay? The brain will freeze. You'll go into that fight, flight, or freeze. Time will expand. You'll go into a theta state. So as I said earlier, anything said here will register as a program with the same intensity as the original trauma. That's the part you have to get. They have the same energy as the original part, the same terror, the same shame, the same pain. It's, it, it registers. So if you can't fight or flee, you'll freeze and you'll leave the body. This is a protective mechanism. So, you know, the bear comes, he's going to bite you, he's going to take your arm off, whatever, I'm gone. Consciousness releases, it leaves the body. The problem is the person didn't die and they never came back in. That's the problem in dissociation and in with consciousness is not in the body any longer. They didn't come back in. And an aspect of themselves is fragmented off, still in the trauma. There's just overload. It's just too much to handle. So on a level, although it's not conscious, it's like, I'll deal with this later. How many of you have had the real common experience of, of losing a loved one, a parent or a, ch a, a child or whatever, and you just went through the motions? It was just like too much. It just was too much. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. Except with trauma, often later doesn't come because they do all their addictions and all their other strategies to not feel the horror of the moment. So. It's overload, there's too much to handle. Your brain is shooting you all sorts of chemicals, numbing chemicals to get through the trauma, to get through the car accident, to get through the rape, to get through whatever you're getting through. And you can't handle it at the time. Depending on the age of the person will depend on how well they can dissociate. Under the age of seven, because of that theta uh, brain state thing, it's very easy to dissociate and get out of the body. And this is not happening to me, this is happening to some other little girl or little boy. And we know this about little kids. We know that if you have a four-year-old and they have an imaginary friend, you don't worry about it, you set the table. You know, like whatever, you want to have, she wants lunch, whatever, who cares? That's no big deal, right? If you have a 14-year-old with an imaginary friend, we're taking a trip down to CDPC, right? Okay, like A, you're not, your brain doesn't do it at 14 very well. But under the age of seven, any time a trauma happens, it's very easy for them to just be in, out of the body, not there, not present. It's not even happening to them. 
And so that gets frozen in time in another part of consciousness. However, what will happen is they will have all sorts of symptoms. They don't stay in the body, they're floaty, they're out, they, they're just not present, they don't learn well in school, they're, what will they say, she's a daydreamer, you'll get things like that. And more importantly, as they get older, it's, it sets up trauma reenactment all the time. Why? Because the person's not really there. And energetically, if you know, you'll just feel like, you know, she's just not, he's just not quite there. You know, he's kind of out there. We'll talk about them. That's what a lot of times what that is. Um, night, uh, no, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but nightmares, intrusive thoughts, and trauma reenactment is all about the person trying to master or heal the trauma. This is what they're trying to do to heal it. That's why you'll see uh, girls who've been sexually abused will go into prostitution. They reenact what happened to them. And I can tell you, treating hundreds of hundreds of trauma people, I've never met anybody who didn't eventually make sense. If they stay with me long enough and we get to the origin of what the original tr trauma is, it, the reenactment makes total sense. The problem is sometimes we just don't stay that long to get the original trauma. Once that's healed, this stops. Okay, so fragmentation of consciousness. Let's talk about that a little bit. Fight, flight, or freeze. Um, as I said, the age of the incident. The, oh, the other time you fragment consciousness is if there's going to be damage to the body. So if, if, it's, a, if uh, it's a car accident, if it's a, any kind of violence in your home, like you'll see these kids that have been beaten, if their consciousness is going to leave the body. You don't stay around for pain. And there's also something about pain that um, uh, the brain starts to shoot you chemicals to numb out. You know, you'll see people who've been in a car, a car accident or something, and they'll like be walking even though they had broken whatever. And it isn't until later when that anesthetizing thing of the brain wears off that they realize how much pain the body's really, they, they're just not even in it anymore. Make sense? So if there's damage to the body, you're going to see more fragmentation of consciousness. And that doesn't matter how old um, uh, the person is. The split off part has the memory with all the emotions as if it's happening over and over. It's like Groundhog Day for that part. It's like it never ends. That part is still stuck in the memory. I can still see myself there. I'm there. I'm in, you know, they, they, that part still has it. Okay, and it's only it's not integrated. It, the energy is not brought back into the body, and and back to consciousness and to the whole person. Well, as I said, once the pattern is set, this becomes the default default pattern for people. So you'll see if if somebody's pattern is set to be angry, and they're just angry, and they're you know they're always angry, angry. And that's like their that's like their fastball. That's the pattern they do all the time. Okay, if somebody. The harder one is, especially if somebody gets out of the body young, because then they do that all the time. Okay, so if somebody's overpowering somebody's body and they can't leave the situation, like you can't walk out of the room, you'll leave the body so that you don't feel the pain. And then that's what they do all the time, even when they don't need it. Well, I shouldn't say they don't need it, but it's something that's triggering them, but they're still safe, but they're gone. They're gone, they don't even know they're gone. So one of my clients, I used to say to him when we would do the treatment, because if you're not in the body, by the way, therapy doesn't work uh, if nobody's home. So I would say to her, take a breath and, or be in the body. And she'd be like, where do you think I am? I mean, she'd get really mad at me. She didn't know what I was talking about. I mean, I, because she had been out for so long, it, that's like their natural way of being in the world. They don't get it even when they go out. So you have to train them and show them about that. Okay, so we have owned, all of us have owned and disowned parts of the self. Like what, what could you, what face could you show at your house and what one couldn't you show? Okay, so there were some kids in the family that were angry all the time. There were some kids that were invisible. There were some kids that kept quiet. They were sick all the time or they couldn't be sick or they were the child star. We all played roles. We all had parts of us that we were able to own and then parts of us we had to fragment out. Sometimes I look at this when I'm working with somebody, um, especially in terms of birth order. Like, how many of you were the oldest ones in the family? Yeah, you get in this field, don't you, huh? <laughs> okay, so what were the rules for the oldest ones? What did we get programmed? 
part of it. Oh, you have to be over responsible, right? Yeah, I can do any. We can do anything, right? So you know, give me your tired, your poor, your humbled masses. Is that us or right? 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 Why would I be asking somebody else's opinion? Like you know, we're usually not very good team players, are we? Right? We get you know, she's not a team player. I get that all the time. Okay. So like you know, I'm I, as I said, I'm I'm like the second oldest of twelve. I've been telling people what to do since I was three. And I don't really get it when people don't listen to what I say. I mean, it's just like unfathomable to me sometimes. It doesn't necessarily make me a great wife, but what can I tell you? OK, so we can do it all. Like, we just, we're out there, right? We, you know, we don't mess with us. We, we're usually pretty strong. OK, how about the baby? Who's a baby in the family? Anybody here? Oh, babies. OK, what, 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 what was your role? What did you have to play? You can admit it. We beat you up. We know you have issues. Come on. <laughs> we gave them to you. <laughs> I should be paying for my sister's therapy. <laughs> so what do we what do we give you? You don't really know anything. What? What? Oh, you're the good one. You're the baby. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't really have to do anything by on her own. You have to be cute, right? Right. You don't usually like those leadership roles. Like, that feels wrong to you, right? Like, uh, I don't really want that. Um, anything else? And how about the middle kids? Oh, uh, look, we only have a couple of those. Usually, do, all right, what did you get programmed? Nothing. nothing. We got nothing. Right, exactly. <laughs> yep. They're shocked I'm even asking their opinion. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. So we get programmed this way. So we have parts of us that we can own, and then there's aspects of us that we can't own. Like for me, I, I always have an opinion. I can't help it. It's in my head and out my mouth before I know it, what, what to do. Okay, fine. It just is. Okay, but what I can't do is vulnerable. That, that, that vulnerable, really? And humility. Oh my God, I remember the first time I felt that emotion. I thought I ate something. Like, I, I, like, I was, what the heck is this? Like, you know, like, it just was not my strong suit. But you can't be helpful if you're feeling helpless. So the helpless me, the part of me that was really terrified about maybe what was going on, that, 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 that can't stay. Okay, because I had to help the others, I had to do this, I had to whatever. I was mommy's little helper, I didn't cook like that, but. You get the idea of the picture. You know, like that was a role. And so that became my habit of being in the world, my pattern of being in the world. Okay. And then I would get triggered on this anxiety, like I told you, like the kids coming home at the house and mess or something. I was like, what is this? Will you people just behave so I don't have to feel this? But it's in my field, it's part of my energy. It was something I had to heal. Okay. Does that make sense to you? So we all have parts that we owned and parts that we didn't own, that we had to like not own. And then depending on where or why we split them off would depend on how much energy is stuck back there, how much terror is back there for me. Some of you split off your anger. And it's not anger. Sometimes split off anger is rage. It is rage. It's two energies. It's anger with helplessness. So it's big. It is so big. And you're so afraid of it. Okay, so then you have a hard time saying no. There's a saying, you, you fold like a cheap suit. You know, like, I mean, you just like go over. Anybody can walk all over you. You have no energy of anger, of power in your field. It's gone. And so that's your work, to bring that back. Otherwise, you will, you, you'll be a victim constantly. And we see that with our clients, like that learned helplessness, we call it. Or they're constantly in these situations where it's reenacting it over and over and over again till they really believe that they're worth less. They really believe that. And nothing could be further than the truth. So we disown parts of ourselves. So oftentimes I'll talk with uh, my trauma people Especially because they can understand metaphor. They can, you can understand pictures. You can understand, uh, you remember things better like that in the brain. I'll say, I'll say to them, uh, you know, I'll talk metaphors about trauma and dissociation, that in the moment of the trauma, you had to leave a man behind. Like for me, I had to leave my vulnerability behind. 
Some of you had to leave your anger behind. Some of you had to leave whatever, your creativity behind. You have to leave parts of you behind. But it's not forever. It's only so you can get up and go to school the next day or go to work the next day or, or be in a situation that day to, to function. You have to pretend something didn't happen. You have to leave that energy behind you there, okay, to move forward. The problem is it's still your energy and you will never be whole and complete and at peace, what we're all longing for, unless you have all your parts back. Sometimes I do this workshop, I call it no part left behind, you know. And it's really about going back and getting the aspects of our consciousness that we had to split off and leave back there so that we could get up the next morning. You'll see this with your kids that you're working with. You'll see this with the adults you're working with. The, the person that just is angry all the time, they're afraid to show their vulnerability. They're afraid to be, to be tender, to be weak. It's terrifying for them. Okay. And so, to me, the work is about finding, sometimes I'll say it like, what crayon are you missing? Okay, like I definitely have my red crayon, but some of you people don't have your red crayon. So I'll talk about, we have to go get the red crayon. Where'd you leave your anger? Where, 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 did, where is it? When we tap into that energy, or when you get triggered in this moment, we'll go back and find, where, where does that really go to? What does this really remind you of? And then we heal there and bring that part back. That's how, you, yeah, that's how you can integrate consciousness. It's a little more complex than that, but that's just the overview of it. So implications for your practice is, again, educate your clients. You're not crazy. There's nothing wrong with you. It's what we all did to survive. Underneath all of their bravado is a loving heart. So never forget that. Think of that baby in the nursery. Think of that. If I just have a, a two new grandchild children this January. I got, to, um, to my kids had kids this week and just to hold these babies and just like oh, this is how everyone is this is how each one of us was and then then we they took us home okay so all uh, it's not who they are it's what they did to cope is the attitude and so don't fall for the costume they're wearing don't fall for you know the what they're putting out or what they're owning and not what they're disowning it's safe to be angry now not hold it inside and be triggered all the time. And then, of course, anger, as we know, turned inward is depression. Then you'll see them cutting themselves or doing or being suicidal or doing like just, you know, these things to their body or not even being aware of their body, uh, or taking care of it. Um, cutting or addictions are so they don't have to feel the original split. I'll say that again. Any kind of cutting addictions um, we could say even the um, uh, anorexia, bulimia, any of that, is so they don't have to feel what's being triggered. That out of control thing or something they couldn't manage at the time. And until we heal that, this will continue. You have to find the missing or disowned parts and, re and reintegrate them. That's how healing happens. And so the key is, and one of the keys of, of doing all this is working on building a safe relationship. And we know that now with brain science, when they talk about mirror neurons, that there's neurons that mirror back to others, their value, their worth. Some of our kids that we work with, or even our adults, I don't know why we keep talking about kids, adults and their parents and their parents, nobody mirrored back their worthiness. Nobody was saying namaste to them. I honor the divinity in you. They were not saying that in their house. Nobody was treating them as they truly are. And so that's why the relationship they have with you is going to be key. I don't care what strategy, technique you have. If you're not in your heart and in your body, healing can't happen. We do, um, in the other program I work with, Her Holiness Saima, it's all about the sacred role of the healer and about the vibration that you are and what vibration you're putting out and how it serves others and how they serve you, the whole aspect of that. And it's, it's really about your energy. You're like a tuning fork energetically when you work with people. So the relationship, and we've known that in social work. They've been teaching that for years. The, all the research shows it doesn't matter what kind of therapy you do, it matters if you're in your heart. It matters in the relationship, so that doesn't change. Okay, so treatment of trauma. 
a couple things. One, there's different kinds of trauma. They'll call them small T traumas. If you see a car, for example, if you see a car accident or some violence, you might have frozen images, um, or if you hear the, you, like a car accident, you might the sound might get frozen in there with all the anxiety that happens. But it, but it's not the same as what we call a big T trauma. Uh, if your body is hurt in the car accident, that's a different kind of trauma. There's more dissociation. Uh, or if you get hurt in violence, more aggression, more dissociation, more fragmentation. It's just way too much coming in, okay? And as we were taught in graduate school, that's all the same. There's still four stages of trauma treatment, assessment, stabilization, trauma processing, and reconnection. We're just gonna add some things to them and some knowledge of, this, of the brain science to make it clearer for you and how to do it. These are, we spoke of Bessel van der Kolk, uh, earlier, he's uh, from Boston, there's a huge psychological trauma conference they do every year. If you have never been to that conference, I recommend you go. He's got the cutting edge research, everything, of uh, new ways to look at trauma. But last night someone asked me about, uh, do, do we have the brain scans that are showing some of these newer therapies work? And I said I had this one. But basically what this shows is this, um, these were some Vietnam vets. This was done in the 90s, so it's really early. This is before we even knew anything about the impact of trauma on the brain. And these were Vietnam vets that came back and they had them write a script of their battle. They injected them with dye and stuck them in a spec scan, and they registered what happened when they read to them the battle. And you'll see the traumatic brain, uh, the important things, the part at the top, it's not red. Red means there's some blood flow, there's activity there, that's the front part of the brain. But uh, the other really important thing is in the middle part of the traumatic brain, there's, there's no, it's not lit up either. That's the part of the brain that tells you you're in a spec scan, you're not in Vietnam. Vietnam. That part didn't light up. These guys were in the spec scans back in Vietnam in their mind, and it just showed what the brain looked like in that. Then they did several sessions of EMDR, which is an eye movement therapy. And what happens after you do EMDR, as I showed you, the eyes are the part of the brain on the outside. You can do it with eyes. Now you can do it with tapping both sides or sounds. They have bilateral sounds. Uh, they, had, they had the guy go through the... the um, uh, the, tr the trauma of the, bra of the Vietnam, they had him work on the brain and they stuck him in the spec scan again, injected him with dye and the brain looked like that. But more importantly, clinically, what you will see is the person isn't in Vietnam anymore. They can remember it, they don't relive it. And they'll say things to you like, oh, it's, it, it's, it feels further away. It's not as charged. I'm not in it anymore. That's what you'll hear people say when you do a trauma processing strategy that worked. Okay, They're, they re, again, it's they remember it. They don't relive it. The, the part of consciousness that fragmented and stayed in Vietnam because maybe somebody was getting killed, the sounds were too loud, maybe they lost their legs, I don't know what happened, but because of the trauma, is no longer in Vietnam. That part is here, present, in present time. And that's what we're looking for. That's the successful healing of trauma. The person is not in the trauma anymore. And they're in present with you in your office or in the spec scan. These were the first uh, scans of the, or brain research that I ever saw that was actually showing that we could make these changes in the brain, which was exactly what we were saying as clinicians that our clients were, were telling us. This is another interesting thing about uh, the brain. and. Um, uh, they showed last night, for those of you who haven't seen it, at the that it was a video from the Harvard, what, what, what was the name of it? The, we talked about this morning, the Center for, the Child. Center for the Developing Child. There's a great video on there they showed of neuropaths and the neuropaths and what happens with chronic stress. So if you can, I really recommend you get on there and watch that video. I was hoping they'd show it today, but whatever. So here's your, here's your brain. This is what your brain is like. You have these like neurons little things when you're born at three months look at what you look at like at two years old and can you imagine what you look like now whole hopefully a whole lot going on but the bottom line is with trauma and the and all the flooding of the chemicals in the brain is these neurons don't develop like they should. They, they don't like have smooth developments. They, they're kind of, some of them shut down. Some of them, you know, they have, uh, they bottom line, they have problems with it. Inside, that was, that's the hardwire, the neurons. Now inside is, um, this is like the software inside it. And it, 
they talk about four things, behavior, affect, sensation, and knowledge. That's what's inside a neuropath, okay? So in the moment of a trauma, this shatters. Too much information comes in and this shatters. And that's why for some of your clients, they don't really know what happened. They have all the sensations. They have all the sequelae of a trauma. Um, like for example, somebody who maybe is always doing hand washing, but she doesn't know where it went to. Okay, she doesn't have the story of where, because this fragments. Or you'll see someone maybe with, um, oh I don't know, like, uh, uh, they have like all this anxiety, but they don't, they just don't know what it goes to or it's just not linked. This fragments, it can fragment on one, uh, two, or three of the pathways. Okay? So that's sometimes why you'll get people who uh, have a lot of symptoms uh, or they might know what happened, but they feel numb. They have no feeling with it. So somebody who maybe saw something horrible, but they don't, it's not connected, it fragmented. The, how they felt and what they know are two different things. And it's like they're, they're collapsed. It's like it's, so what happens in a memory uh, is you, you go down, uh, so something triggers you, okay? And you go down this sled, I think of it like a sled going down a, a hill, okay? You go down to the hurt spot where it fragmented. And that's where you have symptoms. As you get closer to the, that part there is when you start to see your addictions. All the things that people do to not feel where it broke. Okay? So, for example, um, let's see, a neuropath, supposing you worked in the, in the uh, World Trade Center. So every day you'd get up and you'd drive your car and you wouldn't even be thinking about it. You'd go down there, but maybe on this particular day, obviously, you go and the planes hit. That's where it would fragment. So now it's Monday morning after the, or Wednesday or Friday after the World Trade Center, you try to go to work again. And you go, as you get closer to that, you're going to start to panic. You're going to start to, but at least you have the knowledge because that was a public trauma. Think of all these children that have this trauma that nobody speaks about, uh, sexual abuse in the night where you're kind of in a, you're awake, you're asleep. You, you don't have the story that goes with it, but yet you have all the symptoms or all this starts to happen when something similar happens. Now here's why you don't talk about a trauma until you're ready to process it. The more we talk about what happened, and this sometimes happens in the courts when some woman has to re relive the rape, or something, the more you talk about something, all you're doing is like a sled going down a hill, is making a faster path to that break. And then nobody's helping you fix it. And so now you're going to see nightmares, flashbacks, panic, dis panic attack. They're really close to where the whole thing fragmented. But nobody jumps it over to help them to know that it's over, the trauma is over. So treatment is you access the neuropath. We have to be talking about what happened, and then you bridge it. You, you work through the defenses if you need to, or you bridge it with either, to me, some of these eye movement therapies will bridge it faster. And I'll give you a list of, of different therapies you can use to bridge it. So my preference, of course, is fast. Um, I don't want to be there long. And, um, and then you bridge that over that hurt spot, and then the whole thing releases. And people, oh, that's in the past. So the Vietnam guy, you would have him talk about his battle, what happened, and you do EMDR or whatever you're working with as a trauma processing one, you jump it over and then it's over for them. And the good news is you can do this in like a session if it's the right stage of trauma treatment. Some people need a little bit more, but it doesn't have to take years and years and years. That's the good news. Nightmares and flashbacks. So how does the brain process trauma? For most of us, okay, what do you do? You go to work, you get, come home, you hate that job, you're never going back, right? And then, oh, you know, day I've had, blah, blah, blah. And you go to sleep, and then you do REM sleep in your sleep. That's like EMDR, okay? You start, the eyes move back and forth, and the next day you wake up, that's eh, not so bad, maybe I will go back to that job. You kinda, it kind of like processes the day's events, okay? But what happens in a trauma, is you go to sleep and the, obviously your eyes are going to go back and forth. It wakes you up because the brain starts shooting a chemicals and everything when you get to the hurt spot and you start to panic in your sleep and you wake up. 
you, you, you like wake up and you interrupt the processing so the brain can't do its job. And you're creating more neuropaths down to the trauma because the brain's trying to do it. The brain is trying to help you get through what happened during the day. That's the, the role, okay? And so, um, what, so basically what happens is you wake up and you have nightmares. Now if you have a, what, what I know is when I'm working with someone with trauma, and you'll see this with the woman um, who was robbed at gunpoint in the next session, she says the nightmares are different. They're, like, they're, they're better, they're different, like I'm not in them. She, she says, and that, that's saying to me, oh good, that means that the brain is trying to do its work, but she can stay asleep longer for the brain to complete the work. So I don't worry so much if somebody wakes up in the morning and it's like, oh my God, I had a wacky night of dreams. But I, it, it's more when they wake up in the middle of it that I know there's trauma, that they, there's too much um, um, cortisol, adrenaline, all that's getting flooded in the brain and the brain, you can't stay asleep and you panic. Okay, so the purpose of the dream sleep is to process what happened all day long. We also know that for people who have been abused, they can't get to sleep because the bed and sleep is all associated with the trauma. So it triggers the trauma, so then they can't sleep. Okay, flashbacks are the same thing, only they're like nightmares in the daytime. Something has triggered them, or they're on that, uh, that neuropath, and they, and they can't, they, they're flashing back, they, they think they're there. And you'll see that with the woman who was robbed in the thing. She says she'll be at the grocery store, and next thing you know, she's in the trauma. Why? Because there was one part in the trauma where they were, they had locked her in a closet, and they were talking out there. And so she was straining to hear what they were going to say, because her, her grandson and her daughter were out there with them. And so now she would be in the grocery store and she would hear somebody over here talking and it would trigger her trauma. That's how it goes, okay? So that's, and she'd be right in a flashback. She'd be right back in the closet and she couldn't get out and she couldn't get out, okay? And then the same with reenacting the trauma. That's part of the way to kind of master something. So people unconsciously, whatever, it's not really conscious, like I think I'll master my trauma today. It's like they're like drawn to the same thing. Some of it's probably law of resonance, but they're drawn to the same thing over and over again. Almost as a way to master this, finding this man behind that they left. They had to leave a man behind. Trying to find that part of themselves that they can't just seem to, they know something's missing in them. Okay, so. In the treatment of trauma, the first stage is you have to do a really good assessment. You want to, mostly for me, I assess their coping strategies today, their addictions, cutting, eating disorders, are they suicidal? By the way, most trauma patients are suicidal because the, just the thought of it gives them great comfort. And they will not take suicide off their options menu. I tell them, fine, don't take it off, just put it down a few notches, okay? It, until all the trauma is cleaned up, they always want suicide as an option because it just, oh, it'll be over, it'll be over, okay? So it's part of the game. I tell them it's like a cough goes with a cold. It's just part of the game, it's just part of it. I'm not gonna get crazy about it, but if you up the odds, if you start planning it, plotting, whatever, we have a different level, and, we, and of course you have safety issues all around that, but it's just part of, the, part of trauma. You always ask, when did this coping strategy start? Because that's going to give you a clue to the age of the trauma. As I showed you before, a lot of times they don't even know they've been traumatized. But they have all the symptoms. They just don't have the knowledge of what yet. When asking questions about trauma, you instruct them not to give you details. Just give you an overview. So sometimes I'll say to them, okay, I need an overview, of, and, and I instruct them in this, because some people really think therapy is about coming to you and just telling you their story, which as you saw with the neuropath, all you're going to do is make them worth. You'll make that, that road down to where the hurt spot is just easier to get on, and they will get worse if you, if you do that. So I, I just watch them. I say to them, you know, just start when you were little. Give me just an overview, a little bit of information about what happened growing up. You know, grandma died, your house burned down, car accidents, surgeries, asthma. Asthma to me is a trauma. There's a lot of medical things that are trauma that we don't code as trauma or we don't think trauma. But you lose your breath, you can't breathe, you need your mama, you need somebody else there. You can't, it's, it's overwhelming to, to a child. So I watch them slowly, uh, closely, I go really slow with them, and I always give them permission to stop. 
and not tell me anymore. And they don't have to tell me everything. But I get a general idea because mainly what I want to know, okay, how much trauma? What's this brain's like? Where did it start? How fast can I go? Is it an ad adult? Sometimes if I have somebody that's an adult-only trauma, in two or three sessions, they're done. Other times, if they've had a lot of trauma, they've had multiple traumas, I have to go slower with them and really build them up before we go, even go near those traumas. Um, do they have a support system now? And the key factors I'm looking for, the age of the trauma because of dissociation, damage to the body because of dissociation. The other thing is the relationship to the perpetrator. If the one who abused them is, the, is their primary caretaker or somebody that's responsible in a loving way, your relationship with them is going to be very difficult. Because what, how, what will it trigger? I get close to you, eventually you are going to hurt me. You are eventually going to abuse me. So it goes hot and cold. You have those attachment, and the whole attachment disorder feel we could get into about that. Is it a single incident or multiple traumas? If it's a single incident and then their childhood, and I know their brain is strong, I can, with, by the second or third session, go clear the trauma and they're done. If it's multiple traumas, then we have to go slower with them. The second stage is stabilization and safety. This stage, for some of your clients, can last years, and that's okay. Slow progress is still progress, because you have to retrain that brain. You have to teach them how to titrate, how to have a feeling and calm the body, have a feeling and calm the body, and not flood and not dissociate or, or, or become rageful. Um, it's, it, and it's not mental. They really have to be on the circuitry to change it. This is a really important concept. You have to be on the circuitry to change it. You have to be on the neuropath in order to change it. It's not you and I having a conversation about the 10 things you can do next time you want to rip somebody's face off. It will not work. Because the minute you want to rip somebody's face off, you're, I'm in your prefrontal cortex as your therapist. Okay, That's my prefrontal cortex having a conversation with your prefrontal cortex when we're both calm. You get triggered, I'm out of there. I mean, there's like nothing there. Okay, So you want to teach them strategies that when they're on the circuitry, that they can change it. Or you activate the circuitry in your office. You have them think about something that's really annoying them or a situation that happened in present time this week. You stay in present time for the most part with them. You use, uh, the other important thing is to use this future imaging to deal with the current stressor. Like, um, like some of them can't get a job interview because they get panicked in when somebody asks them questions. Or they can't be alone in the house, which is why they have all these boyfriends. You get rid of one boyfriend that you think, oh my God, thank God he's done. And what does she do? She gets another one, just has a different outfit. But it's the same thing. It, it's the exact same pattern. Why? Because she can't be alone in the house. She's too terrified somebody's going to hurt me. And you spend most of your time building a life worth living, getting a job, self-empowering, what's your future going to look like, and you use these strategies, I'm going to give you one to use in a minute, that you can use with them to enhance their visualization. Okay. You're going to give them a measure of relief before you can do any trauma processing with these people that have been multiply traumatized, which is mo most of the people on your caseload, I would suspect, or most of the people that you serve. Um, I, it, why I like the tapping things, as odd as they look, is that they're self-empowering. They don't need me. They can use this at home. They might need to make reminders because when they go limbic, they're going to forget they're supposed to be tapping. But they can put reminders on their, on their, in their house. But they, it's something they can do. And so they, oh, I, I can be in this body. I don't need to dissociate. I don't need to rip your face off. I don't need to run. I can tolerate a feeling. I can stay longer with it. And I can get my brain to quiet, my nervous system to quiet down. Again, the relationship is the key to doing any of this work with anybody. I don't care what your strategy is, to be in your heart and to be there with them. All right, so the other thing in this stage is medication. Medication, most of these trauma people, you cannot do a lot of the trauma work unless they're on some sort of medication. So one doesn't negate the other. It's not that you can't use medication, Some of the, um, and that would be up to their psychiatrist. So I'm not against medication at all. You've got to get them sleeping, you, because if they're not sleeping, their brain's not repairing. So things, guided imagery tapes, or sometimes a sleep aid is fine. 
for them to be on. Body work, anything that gets them in the body and comfortable with their body, if you can get them to get any of that. So even some innovative programs you might create is something where they just, they just do um, even just shoulder massages or things where they can begin to settle that nervous system down, that hypervigilant thing that our trauma people have. Sometimes they'll say to them, uh, like a car on a zero to 10 scale, what's your general idol? What do you idle at? And they'll say to me like five, six, seven, eight. That's where they are. So we don't have any room from eight to 10. You, you have a, a, some kind of a stressor and they're off, the, they're having a panic attack. So get the idol down. Um, meditation or mindfulness, three to five minutes a day to start. It's tricky with trauma people because the minute they start to meditate or slow it down, all the trauma comes up. Okay, so start them with three minutes a day, five minutes a day, even just looking at a candle and staring at the flame. Part of what we're trying to do is retrain the brain to focus, to focus, because they're all over, they're, they're hypervigilant, they're scanning for danger, and that's how we're hardwired. So th three to five minutes a day, it's focus, sustained attention, music, dance, movement, any of those things you can incorporate into your things to get them in the body again, to get them comfortable with being in their body. Yoga, karate, breath work. I was just reading some new um, thing uh, that was coming out about some breath work that they're using now, and they're talking about the vagus nerve and and how if you do this kind of breath work, it will calm that whole nervous system down. Okay, so there's new things coming out all the time, but you've got to be thinking in this arena of body, body-centered, in the body, getting them in there and comfortable. Neurofeedback, biofeedback, anything like that. Um, even um, uh, five to minutes a day of just doing all the things they're grateful for. Start to train the brain to think differently. Think about what's good in your life. Think about, you know, like let's make a list of gratitudes and spend five minutes a day focusing on that or journaling on that. Not, and then the other thing is look at what you ask about when they're in your office. You know, sometimes they come in for therapy, they, they have to dig some, you know, they have to, it's all about pro problems, blah, 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 blah. And it just makes more neuropaths to problems. See if you can focus them, you do need to deal with the problems. And that's not saying don't do that, but focus them or end the session with let's take some time for breathing. Um, let's take some time to do some yoga stretches. Let's take whatever, Whatever you're finding, find the things that you can do that quiet your body down and then teach them to them. Anything you found to be helpful because if you're not doing it, it, it you're going to be like a talking head, you know, like it's just not going to go across. It's things that you're doing that you're finding settle you down that you can then teach to them. Um, guided imagery, Bella Ruth Knapperstack, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bella Ruth Knapperstack, she actually was here. Uh, I think we brought her here in 2005 to do a conference. She has a whole bunch of guided imagery tapes, uh, tapes for anxiety, tapes for sleep, tapes for trauma, tapes for OCD, everything. Um, and so uh, we have them at the office and uh, well, um, I'll have my clients get them or I'll make copies of them for, for them and have them listen to these tapes. And again, it's this whole thing, once they understand the brain, and you explain that to them, they're usually more on board to be doing some of these other things that will help, that will make sense to them of why I have to retrain my brain. Okay, and again, my brain got set like this, mostly in childhood, I have to retrain, retrain it, and it's my responsibility to do it. If I ever want to have peace, if I ever want to be peaceful within myself, I just have to do some retraining. Um, even role playing with the kids. But as long as it's just not a mental logical thing, get the body involved in what they're going to do or how they're going to move their body or how they're going to hold their head. Theater, anything like that would be helpful for them. EMDR or energy psychology in terms of positive visualization you can use in this stage. I don't know if you've heard of the Monroe Institute that also has um, uh, tapes and CDs that will work on right left hemisphere integration so that your brain starts to go across the midline across the corpus callosum so you're they're using more circuits than they have right now 
um, something called brain gym. They're using this a lot in the schools now to get the kids to be on both hemispheres of the brain, to go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and there's some simple eye, like some of my clients will, will just practice doing figure eights back and forth. Or when they're stressed at work, they draw figure eights back and forth. So that you're using a whole brain, you're not going into the trauma response that you don't need here at work. Um, there's a new thing coming out. Um, I actually was over at Belgium. They're using it in Europe. It's called the Tomat. It's called. It's based on Tomatis's work, but the one we were doing in Europe is called uh, the Mozart Brain Lab. And what they did was they they scanned my brain. I'm happy to report I do have one. And um, at first they scan your brain, and then they help you see. Um, it's all about listening and your ear conduction and bone conduction. And so they figure out what frequencies you're not even hearing. And then they develop, there's a program they do with um, uh, Mozart, Gregorian chant, and these like sounds. And you put these earphones on for like an hour and a half, three times a day, and then all night long. I'll tell you by day three, I didn't even want to hear Mozart ever again. Um, it, it knocked your brain for a loop. Um, and um, the, they're, all I can tell you is that in, in Belgium, in Europe, they're bussing kids in with autism to this lab, and the kids are doing well. So we just have, I have a colleague of mine who just went and got trained on it. We will have it, um, I'll have more information probably within a month, but um, we will have it here. But things like that, that do something different, I would begin to explore those kinds of things, not just for your clients, but also for yourselves, for your children. What are the kinds of things we can do to get your brain working optimally? Um, and get thing, getting, getting you at the optimal, you know, moving out of this survival thing that we've kind of been saddled with since we're humans. Okay, so that's just something else. Okay, so now let me teach you some stuff since I've been talking way too long. So I want you to think of something. I'm going to teach you how to do this to enhance a visualization. Okay, I want you to think of something that you would like to do, the opposite of which you know you do. Okay, so you know, like you have this really good intention, you're gonna do blah, blah, blah. You know, you're gonna come home and you're gonna go work out, uh, but you know, you come home and you sit on the couch. You know, like what's your habit and what's something you've been kind of wanting to do for yourself? Or you'd like to be in a meeting and be able to say something, but you know you sit in the meeting and somebody talks louder than you and you freeze up. Um, something like that, a behavior. So it's always best uh, for visualization uh, to do them with the behavior. You got something? Anybody need more time? Okay, good. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to have you image it, and then we're going to do um, some energy site. This is called Be Set Free Fast. I can't give you all the reasons why you're doing it other than you're tapping on meridians. I'm giving it to you because it doesn't have eye movements in it, so I know you can use this with your clients and you won't trigger them. Okay, so if you want to learn how to do energy psychology for trauma processing or anything like that, you have to come be with me. But this I know I can give you, it's safe and uh, will be good for you. And you can use it, um, if you don't have something to visualize, just think of somebody who's aggravating you, you can use it for that too. All right, okay, so take a breath and go inside and be with yourself for a second. I'm gonna do it for, um, well I'll do it for both. So picture something you would like to do, the opposite of which you know you do, and see if you can see yourself doing it. Notice how it feels, notice how comfortable you are doing it, notice your body, is it comfortable when you think of this new behavior. And on a scale of zero to 10, zero means, oh man, I can't even picture this thing. 10 means I've got it. Just note that. Okay, now take a breath and look at me. We're gonna rub here. It's a sore spot above your heart. It's a neurolymphatic drainage spot on the body. Just rub it, it's sore, it should hurt, especially if you've been drinking coffee and eating sandwiches. It's got, it moves toxins, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. If you rub it, it moves the toxins, which makes your energy move faster. It kind of clears things out. The other way, place you can do is rub the back of your neck. See how good that feels.
Okay, so as you rub there, you're just going to say, like, even though I can't picture this, I accept myself. Now, it sounds very dorky, but why you say that is because if you're angry with yourself, nothing will happen. Okay? So you have to at least be in an accepting state. So even though I can't picture this, I accept myself. Just say that. You don't have to say it out loud, although it is always better, but I know you're with your colleagues. You don't want to look like an idiot. <laughs> so even though I can't picture this, I accept myself. That's... That sets you up. Now you're going to tap the inner eyebrow point. It's on the bladder meridian on the body. I'll step here. And you're going to say this. I'm releasing all the sadness in all the roots and the deepest cause of why I can't picture this. If you were working on somebody you're mad at, you could just say the deepest cause and why I'm pissed off. OK, under your eyes, I'm releasing all the fear. in all the roots and the deepest cause of why I can't picture this. Then your little finger right here, it's kind of by the ring finger. I'm releasing all the anger. This is your heart meridian. In all the roots and the deepest cause of why I can't picture it. And then back up here to your eyebrows. I'm releasing all the trauma in all the roots and the deepest cause of why I can't picture this new behavior. And then right here at your index finger, think of your mother doing this because this is the point for guilt, it's large intestine. I forgive myself for not being able to picture it. I just forgive myself. Forgive myself. Take a breath and be in the body. Try to picture what you wanted to picture. Notice what your body's like. For how many of you did it, does it just seem easier to be able to do it? Can you just raise your hand so I get to see a side of that? Oh, not too many. You didn't go too good, huh? Bad group. How many feels harder to picture it? How many feel the same? You're not even awake out there. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's do somebody you're mad at. We'll just do that one. Or something that makes you nervous. Zero to ten. Think of somebody, something or something that's just a problem for you, a fear. Feel your body. Feel where it happened, where it holds in the body. Okay, cross over here. And oh, you're supposed to rate it zero to ten. Just rate it. Ten means I want to rip somebody's face off, or it really makes me nervous. And you just say, even though I had this problem, I accept myself. I say, even though I got this problem, I'm mad, I accept myself. Even though this upsets me, I accept myself. Up here, I'm releasing all the sadness in all the roots and the deepest cause of this problem. Or you can stay with your visualization if you want. Under your eyes, I'm releasing all the fear in all the roots and the deepest cause of all this problem. Your little finger, I'm releasing all the anger in all the roots and the deepest cause of all the problem. Back up here, and I'm releasing all the trauma in all the roots and the deepest cause of all the problem. Then your index finger. I forgive myself for having this problem. I forgive myself. I forgive myself. Now take a breath, awareness back in the body. Did anybody get better? Oh, one person. No, it's a couple. <laughs> anybody get worse? I'll be here all day now. Anybody feel a difference in their body as they just tapped it? Anybody want to come? Oh, good. Phew, there you are. All right, I thought you were sleeping over there. OK. What you're trying to do is you activate something. And again, it's one thing for in a group. It's another thing if somebody in your office. But you, I would recommend you take this and you use it for yourself, mostly when you're acting limbic. OK? It's kind of hard to imagine things in here or whatever. Or when you want to do something, and for some limbic reason, you can't seem to make it happen. OK? Use it first for yourself, then you'll be more likely to try it with your clients. 
but you have to use this step first for yourself so that you know it works for you or it doesn't work for you. If it doesn't work for you, find another method. It's okay. So the implications for a practice is educate your clients. You have to build their strengths before we talk about your trauma. Some people come into therapy thinking, if I just talk about this, I'll be all better, and nothing could be further from the truth. Small progress is still progress. As I said, addictions are how they coped. Once they're off their addictions, as those of you in the addiction field know, the trauma will surface. Now, they have to feel it to heal it. You can't just be cognitive. There has to be some activation of the circuitry. Don't go logical on them. Listen with both your ears. Uh, and then the other question is for yourself. But can you tolerate emotions? And do you feel safe? Are you triggered? Do you need support? Any of you who had a client react or get angry at you really bad in a session and you got triggered, it will impact your, you, your, you went limbic, your amygdala is wired. Fix that. Get treatment for that. Get support for that so that you can stay in this field and not, um, you know, it's vicarious traumatization being in this field. But if you do these things, you'll stop. Your, your amygdala will do better. Your brain will do better. They're not hopeful, tra hopeless trauma treatment. Okay, trauma treatment, I'm going to go through this fast. You can't talk about the trauma until you're ready to process it. Otherwise, you'll make them worse. Get training in a trauma processing method. I don't care what you do, EMDR, TFT, it's like alphabet soup up there. You, CBT is fine as long as you're trained in flooding. Learn the flooding method of CBT. But if you're going to do trauma work, then get training in a trauma method. You access the neuropath. You help them to see, face, be with the emotion. You'll see this in the video, the behavior, and the knowledge so that they, that they couldn't take in at the trauma. And again, be sure you have enough time in a session. Oftentimes, it will involve a longer session, never before you go on vacation. Always get an emergency contact at a ride home for them. Not for you, for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to quickly show you this, because I know we're short on time. Um, this is of a woman robbed at gunpoint. Um, what happened was, and that sometimes this is an emergency situation, she is in the flashback. She is in the nightmares. She has spent a week at CDPC. They medicated her. Nothing worked. Uh, she's suicidal. I'm working at CHP, and I'm the on-call worker, so I get her. I know I either have to do something or she's going in the back in the hospital. So I, it, whatever, I just was brave and, and I did it with her. You're going to see clips from her first session with me. Uh, it's only 10 minutes total, a clip uh, three days later, and then a clip six weeks later where she talks about the difference. OK? <laughs> Good. 
that's a good sign. You should sometimes the ones that hurt it, the ones that you're in touch. Come on back up here. Yeah. Okay. Think about that part of it. Is it moving? Thank you. Do you like it's moving? It's moving. Can it still grab you, though, if you think of those noises behind your head? Can it grab you a little bit, or is there a different part of the head? Okay, let's go again. We've just got to get another part of it. This is just different parts of the trauma. We're trying to let your brain look at it again and move it, okay? That's what we're trying to do. Get it, like that record, get it unstuck, okay? We'll get it, we'll get it. I know, this is hard. Tap right here, two hands. Well, how about this? Nightmares. Have you had, have they been yeah. better? The nightmares are not better. You're not any better. You're still having nightmares. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I can't understand them like that. You know, like I might see, I might see the situation, but I see it in a different way. Sometimes I have the nightmare that it's happening, and it happens in a different way. Okay. And have you been having that all along? Yeah. Okay. For six months, I've been. For six been months, you've been like this. Okay. And now we did this Friday, and did you have nightmares Saturday, Sunday? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did they seem any different? Yeah, I was. I didn't wake up as as uh, sick like I was before. Okay. Like I woke up more understanding of it. You know, like I was not in the situation. And, you know, and like all the times I had it, I felt like I was in there. Okay. And then at this time, I realized it was, you know, like I was dreaming. Okay, so you could separate it more. Now you're dreaming it. Yeah. It's not happening again. Yeah, now I, I felt like it wasn't, I wasn't there again. Okay, it's still a lousy dream, mm -hmm. but you're not in it. Yeah. Okay, so like you got I'm some distance it, from it. Uh, you're seeing it. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. That's a good sign. I don't sign. know how that happened, but... That your brain processed more. That's how it happened. You still got I was it? playing with, my, with the baby because it was the most happy moment there. Yeah. And then it was so... You know, it was a plane so happy, and yeah. it was the most terrible thing in the world. How could we, that moment was so... Okay, well, look at that, that moment now. The world to me, that moment. Okay, look at that moment now. Zero to ten, how in your face is it? How real is it still, when you think about it? I mean, I know it's, it's terrible. It feels like ten. Okay, let's get it. Let's get it. Come on, we just got to get your brain to know it's over. It is over. You survived. Your grandson survived. You, you must have done the right thing. Everybody's still alive. Yeah. you got to remember that. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Don't frustrate my job. <laughs> <laughs> keep forgetting my job. Back up here. Close your eyes. Open them. Look down here. Over here. Good, huh? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, huh? Okay, go look at it. It's moving. It's moving. It's going. I'm going back. I'm going back to going down to the floor. I don't see the face then. Okay. I'm on the floor with the baby, grabbing onto the baby. Okay. I'm thinking about the baby that I'm going to suffocate because he kept on smashing the pillow down on the floor to me. Okay. It was a big, big sofa pillow. Okay. And he kept me and the baby's face under it, and I kept on thinking about, please, I'm with the baby suffocating. Mm -hmm. Okay, how real is that right now? Pretty real? Yeah. Let's get it. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you feel seeing yourself actually that first time? Well, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. I looked like a real psycho case. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I looked like the day that I turned myself in. <laughs> I'm glad you looked that day. I might have even looked worse than that because that day was the day I was going to give up yeah. everything. But, um, yeah, you're looking pretty bad. From that same day, all of what we have covered, you know, has been the the most, the largest improvement on every area 
that I could ever imagine. Okay. Well, you talked about you used to wake up every morning and see his face. And the gun. And uh, I don't see that. That's gone. gone. That's gone. That's gone. The nightmares? The nightmares I don't have anymore. I have maybe a couple of, you know, little nightmares, but it doesn't have to do with me being in the trauma or anything okay. like that. Okay. And, um, like, if I have a stressful day, I might have a little nightmare, but it's not, you know, it doesn't overwhelm me or it's not, okay. um, like, spiritually, I have become stronger. Okay. You know, and I feel that it's been because of this. Okay. Because uh, I'm able to do this at home, mm -hmm. and, and I, uh, like, the feelings will, like, uh, I'll, I'll have the feelings that I'll relax myself, and then, you know, like, they'll go, like, to the back of my thoughts. Okay. I could bring them to the back of my thoughts now with something I couldn't do before. Okay. And um, I'm not feeling guilty about not being able to uh, uh, keep my grandson, mm -hmm. you know, because there was nothing that I could do. I know that now that... Uh, I would have got myself killed, or, or, or maybe they could kill the baby, because if the baby would have started screaming, there would have people would have come, and they would have, they would have gone crazy and did something foolish. Right, right. So my best, so now, now when I think it over, I think that I did the best thing that I should have done so the baby wouldn't cry. Right. Like, I just yeah. released him, and, and I said that, God, I release him, but I, please, you know, and, and I think in that same way, um, spiritually, my spirit left with him because my, I don't even know how I was here anymore. But I think that was the best thing that could have been done because they, he would have been screaming and crying and that would have caused some terror. You're right, you're that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And, and you um, said you used to have flashbacks of, yeah. like you'd be in the store? I'd be in the store or something and, uh, and I would be like, Unconsciously, I would be looking at the groceries, but then I would not be there. I would be in the thing. Okay, you'd be in the trauma. And yeah. that stuff has stopped. And so those that, flashbacks have stopped. I have stopped that. They have stopped. And um, what else? Uh, um, basically, the nightmares are done, the flashbacks are done, she's done. Um, I saw her actually for months later. We cleared up some other childhood traumas, things like that, but that particular trauma was complete. That's trauma processing. That's when you know it's done and it's possible. So that's why I wanted to just show you that clip. Last stage, just in, I know my time is up, in this stage, it's e it gets fun. The client begins to face their life without terror, shame, and unworthiness, but this is frightening because it's new. Remember, your brain likes what it knows. Um, so we do the visualization. Some of the, I can use the tapping with the eye movements. It's even stronger now for visualization. We create a new life. At this point, you can talk about God or make meaning. If you try to do it earlier, it's spiritual bypass, and then they don't deal with the anger and the rage they have. So that's why at this point, um, be, otherwise the anger has to stay dissociative, dissociated. At this point, we'll often talk about that. They wish to serve others, make some meaning, and know that they're more than anything that's ever happened to them or anything they've ever done. And this is the gift of trauma work. Thank you very much for your attention. and. Come and train with me. Thank you. <laughs>